Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Angie Misseldein. Uh, lecture 4, we are still in section 1.2. It turns out there's a lot of stuff to say about sets and such. Although in this lecture, we're not going to, well, I mean, these will be sets, but we're really going to focus on the equivalence relationship uh, side of the, the section header there. And so what is an equivalence relationship? Well, one answer is this is one of my very favorite topics. Um, as, as one who studies algebraic combinatorics, partitions is something that is dear and true to my heart. Uh, they, they come up with sure rings and a lot of other stuff I do in my own personal research. So we're going to talk about equivalence relationships in this lecture, and there's a lot that can be said here. This one mostly will present the definition and some examples of equivalence relationships. So remember before we had to find what a relationship is, right? What is a relationship? Say that we have two sets, like say A and B. And so a relationship R was some subset of the direct product of two sets. And so then whenever the element A comma B is inside the, uh, inside the relationship R, we would say that A R, B, things like that. Well, it turns out using R as your relationship symbol is kind of corny. Uh, typically, we'll use a, a different symbol, like in this case, a little twiddle. We'll say like A, twiddle, B, or something like that. Uh, so that's the general definition of a relationship. Uh, we then proceeded, after we defined this, to define what a function relationship is. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about a different relationship, which is often referred to as an equivalence relation. So an equivalence relation is uh, you often use something that in some regard looks like an equal sign. So you don't typically use equal itself because that's typically uh, reserved for equality of sets. Uh, but we could use things like a congruence symbol, uh, like when you do modular arithmetic, the triple equal sign there, or congruence, like maybe if you do geometry or approximately or just a single twiddle or twiddle line. There's, there's a couple of different options one could do here, but you often use a symbol that in some regard resembles an equal sign here. Now, an equivalence relationship is going to be a relationship on a single set X. So what that means is it's a subset of X cross X. A equivalence relationship always relates things from the same set to another element of that set. And so it's a relationship on a set with itself that satisfies three properties, which we could call the axioms of an equivalence relation. That if something's an equivalence relation, the following three properties must hold. Uh, and without one of them, it's not an equivalence relationship. The first one is referred to as the res reflective property. The reflective property says that every element is related to itself. So if you take any element X inside the set, X will be related to X. Or as this is an equivalence relationship, we'll say that X is equivalent to itself. And when one thinks of an equivalence relationship, you often want to think of with the following idea that we're trying to generalize the notion of equality. So when it comes to equality of like numbers, right, X is equal to X, that's a property we want for general equivalence relationships. The second property is referred to as the symmetric property, which says that if X is related to Y, then Y is related to X. The, the order doesn't matter. Who's on the left, who's on the right, it doesn't matter whatsoever. And this is again a property we see with equality, that if X is equal to Y, then Y is equal to X. That, that's a property of equality. Equivalence relationships are generalizing this principle. Uh, and lastly, for an equivalence relationship, we require the transitivity property, uh, the transitive property. This tells us that if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X is related to Z as well. Uh, and we see a similar property for equality. If X equals Y and Y equals Z, then it must be that X equals Z. So as equivalence relationships are trying to generalize the notion of equality, you see that these three axioms of an equivalence relationship are exactly these three properties of equality that we demand when we, when we work with equations and such. So when one has an equivalence relationship, some related terms that we're going to define here is if you have a typical element X inside of the set that has an equivalence relationship, then you often draw something like X uh, inside the box there. So bracket X bracket. Sometimes people write things like X bar 
or, or something like that. What this is describing is what we call the equivalence class. This is going to be the set of all things, it kind of wrapped around to the other side there, all things, we want all elements of X which are related to X there. Now X, of course, is going to be inside of this set because of the reflexive property. Equivalence classes are never empty. This is the main reason why we have property one here. X always belongs to the equivalence, um, the, the, the X always belongs to its own equivalence class. Uh, but then you'll also contain any other member of this set that's equivalent to X. And because of the symmetric property and the transitive property, it doesn't matter which element you use inside the set here. Um, an element that belongs to an equivalence class we call a representative. And if you interchange X with anyone it's equivalent to, that is you pick a different representative, it'll describe the same equivalence class. It doesn't matter which representative you choose. Oftentimes there's a natural selection on who you choose here. And let's see some quick examples of this. So let's take as our set X, the set of ordered pairs of integers. So A and B are both integers such that B is not zero. So we take the set of ordered pairs of integers so that the second coordinate is never zero. And we define an equivalence relationship on those elements, they're ordered pairs. So we have two integers here, right? We say that the pair AB is related to CD if the product AD equals BC. All right, so we're gonna take the first term times this. So we take in the first in the first pair, we take the first term and in the second pair, we take the second term. We multiply those together, it's AD. That should equal the product of BC, right? So you take the second term from the first one and the first term of the second one. So if you always take the product of the two numbers in different positions, we want that to be the same. And if that happens, we say the two pairs are equivalent. Now we want to show that this forms an equivalence relationship. How does one do that? Well, we have to check the three axioms. We would begin by showing that the operation, or sorry, that this relationship is reflexive. So to show the reflexive property, we have to take a generic element. So we would say something like let A comma B be inside of our set X. So it's just a generic element. The only thing we can suppose about this element a comma B is that it's inside of X, which means that A and B are both integers and B is not zero. All right, so then notice the following. Then the product AB is equal to AB. That is a fact of equality, like we mentioned earlier. AB equals AB, and therefore we get that A comma B is related to A comma B because that's what's expected, right? If you take A times B, that's equal to B times A. So we get uh, equality there. And so therefore we get that A, sorry, AB is related to AB. That proves the reflexive property. So that's how one always shows the reflexive property. You're going to just take a generic element of the set and argue by the definition of the relationship, why that generic element is related to itself. That's generally a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, symmetry, how does one do symmetry? So to prove the symmetry, uh, the, the symmetry axiom, what you do is the following. You're gonna select two elements. So we're gonna say A and B and then C and D. These are elements in X uh, such that A comma B is related to C comma D. So to prove symmetry, you always have to assume a relationship that two elements are related to each other. And then from there, you want to argue that I can reverse the relationship. So by assumption, we, did, we assume there's a relation there to get started. Because uh, symmetry is a, is, a, is a conditional statement, if then type statement. So we assume the if part and we're going to prove the then part uh, based upon that uh, hypothesis we're assuming. So what do we do next? Well, we now assume that these things are related, so unravel the definition. So this tells us that a, uh, a D, whoops, a D equals B C. And so then we might have to, you know, twist some things around a little bit. Uh, thus, we see that C B equals D A. So you kind of have to turn that thing around a little bit, but these are just properties of equality. And so therefore we get that CD is related to AB.
like so. And so notice, looking at the definition of this object right here, if AB is related to CD, that means AD equals BC. So using properties of equality, I was able to take this equation and switch it around. Um, I had to use the commutative property of multiplication, and I used the symmetric property of equality. But these two, these two equalities are equal to each other. This equality right here is the one associated to this relationship. And this equality right here is the one associated to this relationship. It's a subtle thing, but that's what one would do to show the symmetric property here. And so for the symmetry property, you assume one pair is related, and then you have to show that the reverse relationship is also present. All right, the transitivity. So transitivity requires, we assume we got three elements in the set that are related. So we'll say something like the following, let A comma B, C comma D, and E comma F be inside of X such that AB is related to CD and we want that CD is related to EF. So we assume that we have two relationships here. And so then we want to infer from this why AB is, is related to EF here. Now the next thing to do is to unravel the definition. What does it mean for AB to be related to CD? So then this tells us that a, a, a D, excuse me, is equal to BC. And that's what the first relationship tells you, this one right here. The second relationship right here tells us that CF is going to equal a DE. Assuming I did all those correctly, right? AD equals BC and CF equals DE. Hmm. Now this one's a little bit trickier than the previous ones. Like how do we... How do we relate these things together? Interesting. Well, with this one, we're, I'm going to try to combine all of these things together. So we might say something like the following. Okay, hence, we see that ADF is equal to the following. So ADF, ADF, let's see, well, AD is equal to BC. That's great. So ADF is equal to BCF. That's the first part. And then CF is related to DE. So that will equal BDE. And so we have that these things are equal to each other via the transitive property of equality. You're probably going to use that uh, since equality is coming up here. And then the next thing to notice is that, well, we're looking for, and this is a strategy I can't overemphasize when one does something like this. Whenever you're working on a proof, if you ever get stuck, sometimes it's a good idea to go to the end of the proof and work backwards. So we say something like, therefore, A comma B is related to E comma F. That's what we're trying to prove. And it's important that we pay attention to what is it we're trying to prove here. But what does A, B relate to E, F even mean? That would mean something like, thus, A, F is equal to BE. So this is the statement we're trying to show, AF equals BE. Um, we're kind of there. We have ADF equals BDF. That's exactly what we need, except for we have this extra D. Hmm. How do we get rid of the D? Well, we can say something like the following. Okay, well, couldn't I just like divide by D? Well, one has to be careful. You can't just divide by any integer. You can only divide by integers that are not zero. Oh yeah, well D's not zero, right? Because D was the second coordinate and by definition, that second component can't be zero. Aha, we see why that's part of the definition now. This is something you should also pay attention to that when we have a definition, there's usually a reason why those things are put as part of the definition. It's not just some arbitrary thing. It's like we only will accept purple numbers. Why purple, right? There's a reason. Um, and same thing with a proof, right? If you're trying to prove if this, then that, there's probably a reason we listed all of the assumptions we did. If there was an assumption we didn't use in the proof, then it means we didn't need it and we can make a stronger statement by removing it. So the fact that we had to have the second component be non-zero means we probably need it eventually. So we could say something like um, by canceling Oh boy, are there two L's in canceling? You're now going to see why I am not having a PhD in spelling here. By canceling D, which does not equal zero, we then get, I'm going to erase this thus, we get that AF equals BE and we finish the proof showing the transitivity property. 
And so this is not the most polished proof you're ever gonna see here. If you wanna look in the lecture notes, you can see a better version of these proofs. I'm trying to write this out in real time so you can kind of see as, you, as yourself need to become a mathematical proof writer. I want you to kind of see the thought process that goes into writing a proof. Believe it or not, writing a proof is a creative process. Some people often think that, oh, math is so, so objective. There's always a right, there's always a wrong, and it's very clear cut what that is. Um, and then people are like, oh, art is so subjective, right? There's, there's these subtleties, nuances, you know, it takes a real talent to become a great artist. It turns out that mathematics is both objective and subjective. There are some things that are very, very objective, right? Clear, right, clear, wrong. But it turns out that mathematics is also a creative process. Writing a proof is like creating an art form of some kind. It's very difficult to teach proof writing because it's a creative process. How do you teach someone to be creative? Students, be creative. You know, I can say things like that. But this creative endeavor takes a lot of practice and I can try to guide you along the way. But it's very difficult, so give yourself some patience here. And so that's, that's, this is an example of how one writes a proof. It's a creative process. Um, this now shows that uh, this set of pairs of integers is an equivalence relationship. And we actually call the set of equivalence relationships the rational numbers. Um, a rational number is just a pair of fractions, right? Uh, I should say a pair of integers, which we call a fraction. We often denote a comma b instead by the symbol a divided by b. That's what we usually do. But we say that two fractions are equivalent to each other exactly in that context. One half, oh boy, one half equals three, uh, three six. Yeah, I can do that. Because one times six is equal to three times two. This is the typical relationship on the rational numbers. And so by placing an, a relationship on pairs of integers, we can then create the set of rational numbers that we know and love.